Robert Cole, and it's speculated that he was under the influence of drugs at the time, decided to break into a Tulsa, Oklahoma home this last Wednesday. The couple living at the home, Willie and Danae Houston, heard a crash coming from their daughter's room and they rushed in to find a folding chair that had been sitting outside was now in their daughter's room and it smashed through the bedroom window. And when they uh, listened, they heard sounds coming from the garage. And they assumed that whoever had broken the window was making preparations to find something to climb through the window into their home. And so uh, uh, Willie decided to take his stand inside the front door with it open just slightly. He kept a watch on the house. And so, sure enough, soon Cole approached the house ready to go in and take the things that he had in mind to take. At that moment, Willie threw open the front door, ran out, tackled uh, Cole, and he hogtied him there on the front yard. Then he kissed his wife goodbye and said he was going to be late for work if he didn't leave right away and she needed to call the police to collect the man on the front yard. <laughs> now, when Robert Cole had determined that he was going to go to a peaceful neighborhood and bring him to a home, I don't think that he ever imagined that his actions on that day would find him hogtied and in the back of a police cruiser in very short notice. But that was the consequences were the actions that he had taken on that day. The old theme song from that uh, TV show, Greta, uh, reminds us, don't do the crime if you can't do the time. We might simply say you better think twice about doing something wrong because the consequences might be something that you don't want to face. In regards to our decision to rebel against God, the cost is truly frightful. As the psalmist warns us in our text this morning, we're going to take Psalm 2 for our text this morning. Psalm 2, where we find these words. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage, and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron, and dash them into pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Why do you see in our text this morning, first of all, the plot to overthrow God? The psalmist says in our text, uh, he pictures a nation raging. He pictures the people plotting and the kings and the, the rulers conspiring against God. As the king of God's people, David could see how opposed to the influence of God were all the nations that surrounded Israel. Nation is a, a tiny portion of the human creation God had reserved for his own possession. Here were people who were supposed to be attending to his ways, worshiping him, being his people in the presence of the world, but they were surrounded by nations that wanted to destroy them. Not much different from the day, is it? And Israel was surrounded by nations that wanted to drive them into obscurity and destroy the influence of God in their midst altogether. But that wasn't the only problem that Israel faced, because even as they were opposed from outside by all the nations, from within, the own, the own, their own people, the people that were supposed to be devoted to God, found themselves <laughs> in wayward. They, they were wandering in every different direction. They also were turning away from God in their own lives. David says here that they had turned away from God and his anointed. Now, one of the 
interesting things about scriptures that I've always found is the way that God uses sometimes the apparent meaning of a passage to mean something very different. Here King David, when he's writing this psalm, is talking about his own reign, that God has set him up as a favored one and anointed him to be king over Israel, and that God was going to have his favor over him. But all the words of this psalm point naturally for us, we see the application, to Jesus, the anointed one, the son that is being described throughout this passage, of course, we understand is Jesus Christ, the one who God set up to reign in Zion forever. The, the very imagery of this passage, that God is going to give his anointed one to triumph, that God is looking upon his anointed one and, uh, and seeing him with favor, all these things point to Jesus Christ, point beyond David, to his descendant through his lineage. They had turned against God, and they had turned against his anointed, and the two were practically the same thing. Because if you had turned against the anointed of God, if you turned against his son, then you have turned against God. You can't have God without a relationship with Jesus Christ. In fact, Jesus said, no one comes to the Father except through me. We understand that uh, in Jesus' day that Israel was rejected because they rejected the Son that had been sent to them. When God came uh, uh, and delivered the Messiah that he had promised to them, and they turned away, they turned their backs on the Lord, they turned their backs on God as well. You cannot despise the Anointed One and maintain a relationship with God. Now, it wasn't just in David's time that these things were this way, that, that there were so many people, people in power and position, and people in the common, uh, on the streets uh, that were opposed to God. We've seen that throughout history as well. Those who have been faithful to God are in the minority, and they ever seem surrounded by those determined to dethrone God. You look through every age from the time of Christ coming to this very present one, and you find always that the people of God are in the minority. And today, it is no different. We find ourselves living in a nation with a strong Christian heritage, and yet we face those who oppose God at every turn today. Our original founders stated that, stated almost to a man that, it would be impossible to have a government as they were setting up, a government for the people and, and by the people and of the people. It would be impossible unless the people were faithful to follow God, unless the people had their hearts turned toward God. We see that in the, the mottos that were adopted by our country. One nation under God and in God we trust were mottos that grew out of that acknowledged need to be God's people and to seek his blessing and to seek his direction. Now our elected officials often mock the devotion to God, if not publicly. They proclaimed it when they thought the microphones were off. Our courts have systematically removed the expressions of faith from our public place. And our military have once issued pocket-sized Bibles for their servicemen to carry with them wherever they sent them in all the world. Now they no longer allow them to carry Bibles in many of the theaters that they send their people to for fear that they might offend somebody in doing so. And that's not even the worst of it. You know, it's a, it's a rule now in the military that chaplains are not even allowed to have a Bible on their desks. And that's not just in some places, that's everywhere. Even here in the United States, a chaplain in the military is not allowed to have a Bible on his desk. That's how far our nation has gone from the way that we used to be devoted to the Lord in our lives. Outside government, we find this nation turning away from God as well. A rewriting of history and the sciences have taken place in our children's school curriculum to defy God's presence and his influence. Secular colleges and universities have become hotbeds of twisted and perverted teaching trying to destroy the faith of the young people that are entrusted to them. Our social networks, if you get on the internet much, our social networks show strong strains of intolerance on the part of the young to any teaching uh, from the scriptures that will not agree with the cultural bias of today to the point of open hostility and some 
sometimes threats expressed on that on those social and that social networking. And I ask you today, why is there such a rapid opposition to God? Well, our passage explains it to us. It tells us that there's that opposition to God because people want to be free. They want to break free from the necessity of following God. What is it that those who are in rebellion against God are quoted as saying here in this psalm? Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. That's the intention of the rebellious, to remove God's influence from their life, to cast off the bonds, because man sees service to God as binding, since it would cause us to renounce the way of sin that we are being enticed to. Man's heart leads him to sin. God's uh, orders to tell us to stay from sin, and we want to cast off those bonds that God's putting on us. I think there's another reason behind man's rebelliousness, too, and that's this, a failure to take responsibility for our sinfulness. We don't want to face up to our guilt. <laughs> After stopping for drinks at an illegal bar, a Zimbabwe bus driver found that the 20 mental patients that he was going to be transporting from one Zimbabwe city to another had made their escape off his bus while he had been drinking. They had wandered off. And now he was in trouble because he didn't want to admit that he had been drinking in this illegal bar instead of doing the task he was supposed to do. So what did he do? He went down to the next bus stop and offered the people there waiting at the bus stop free bus rides. And they all got on the bus and he drove them to the mental institute and told the people there, don't listen to a word they say, they're delusional. Turn them over as if they were the mental patients there. They couldn't discover what had happened for three days. Three days those people were locked up in a mental institution because everybody thought they were crazy because this man didn't want to take responsibility for the wrong that he had done. People run away from responsibility for their sinfulness. They don't want to admit that they are wrong. Rather than face the consequences for their actions, they, they scapegoat other people. They make excuses, and sometimes they even determine to oppose God in their lives. Because a relationship with God is going to hold a point to the fact that they mess things up. Well, here we find the plot to overthrow God. We also find in this passage God's response to that rebellion. Told first of all that God laughs in derision against those who would rebel against Him. Now, if you've been around little children much, you might have had to endure a, a toddler's fury at some time. A displeased toddler might double up their fist and hit you with it. That's when you try not to laugh. Because you know that laughing's not going to reinforce anything good for them. You know, first of all, it's probably just going to make them angrier, and then it's not going to teach them not to hit it. They're sitting there laughing at them after they just hit you. But it is laughable, because with all the power they have behind that fist, you know it's not even going to raise a bruise on you. There's no power in their punch. That fury is wasted. How does a little talker think he's going to enforce his will by the might of this fist when he doesn't have any might against a, an adult with it? Well, we can spew our hatred against God, we can shake our fist at the sky, we can rail against Him, we can try to oppose Him in every way that we find to do in this present world. And you know what it amounts to? Nothing more than a toddler's punch. Against God, it doesn't even make an impact. It's laughable. And so we're told God is laughing in derision against those who would rebel against Him because what is our fury? What is our wrath? in his face. We can do nothing. We are powerless before him. God laughingly scorns those who oppose him with all of their prestige and with all of their might. It's laughable before God. The next time that college professor is using the power of his lectern to mock or deride or oppose God with his human intellect, see him for the baby throwing a tantrum that he is. That's the way God sees it. He's laughable in his opposition to God. And even the one who holds the highest power in the land, the highest power in the world, in this free world, when 
when he mocks God's followers by referring to those who cling to their God, or when he opposes him in the courts and in counter uh, briefs and, and in legislation, when he signs into law things that are opposed to God, or he refuses to sign things that favor what God has told us, remember, remember that this man in the most powerful office in the land or in the world is but a court jester in the heavenly courts. His power is nothing against the one that he would oppose. For all his earthly authority, his power is laughable to God. God laughs in derision against those who oppose him, but that's not his only response as we see here in this passage. We're also told here that God is angered, and he will respond righteously with harsh retaliation against those who oppose him. And it reminds me of this one simple fact, opposing God is not smart. Here's another of those real life uh, a dumb criminal stories. It seems a guy in Arkansas was getting a little bit thirsty for a uh, alcoholic beverage and he didn't have the funds. So he gathered up to himself a cinder block and went down to the local uh, the local liquor store, which was closed at the time. Raising that cinder block above his head, he threw it with all his might into the window, expecting that when the window shattered, that he'd be able to grab several bottles and run off. The only thing was, the cinder block bounced off the window, hit him in the head, and knocked him unconscious right there. It turns out it was a plexiglass window he was trying to break with the cinder block. And the stores and the camera in the store caught the whole thing. So you know it's going to be shown again and again. Another incident, a, a teenager was in the hospital recovering from a serious head wound that he had received from an oncoming train. And they asked him in the hospital room as he's recovering from these serious head injuries, what happened that he should tangle with the train in that way? The youth told the police there that he was simply trying to see how close he could get his head to a moving train before he was hit. That might be done. But it hardly compares with the decision to make enemies of the creator of the entire universe. The one who, the one who was sent from him and that he loves above all others. To make an enemy of God is far more foolish than anything you'll see acted out among human criminals today. God will not keep his anger forever. God is very patient with us in our rebellion. He wants us to have an opportunity to turn to him, but eventually our desire to turn away from God will be met with force. Eventually, those who defy him will find what it means to court the anger of the most awesome force that has ever and will ever exist. Well, we've seen the rebellion of man. We've seen God's response. Finally, finally, we come to one other thing that this passage points out, and that is our choice in the issue. The choice is stated simply in our text. Either submit to God or face destruction. There's no compromise. There's no middle ground. There's no gray area. There's no area where we can acknowledge that God exists but determine not to follow him. There's no area of passivity towards the person of God. Either you are his friend or you are his enemy. And that's not because God is petty in his nature. Our God, again, is generous and he is quick to forgive. He sincerely wants to have us on his side. But there is nothing but our destruction for those who will determine to be apart from him. Our sinful ways are what destined us for destruction. And he is willing to remove the pet, that penalty from us if only we turn around and seek him. If only we will give up our rebellion and turn to him, he's ready always to forgive us. Man stands on the subway tracks. The train's barreling down on him. He calls out for someone to save him. 
But then he refuses to move from the tracks. <clears throat> when that man dies, who is at fault? Those who could not rescue him because he stayed on the tracks? Or the one who refused to turn from the path of destruction even as he claimed he wanted salvation? A person can't blame God for their destruction when they refuse to come away from their destructive lifestyle to the place of salvation at God's side. If we say we want God's salvation, there needs to be a turning, there needs to be a changing. We can't remain in rebellion against God. How can we say that God is wrong for condemning us if we remain in open defiance to Him? Our text words the choice in this way. Kiss the Son, lest He be angry, and you perish in the way. A friend on Facebook yesterday mentioned that yesterday was National Kissing Day. And they were hoping everybody enjoyed National Kissing Day. I thought at the time I didn't even know it was National Kissing Day. And here I have a message today called Kiss Him or Die. <laughs> right in harmony with it. Kiss the Son, lest He be angry, and you perish in the way. The picture of the kiss here is not a romantic kiss, of course. Or the kind of kiss that Judas planted on Jesus' cheek and betrayed him. The kiss is as one comes before you as a royal person, and you kneel before them, and you kiss their offered hands, or you, you prostrate yourself to the ground and you kiss their feet. It's a, a show that you are acknowledging their lordship over you, that you're acknowledging their authority, their power, their right to rule you in everything. You can do that. You can get down and kiss the king, kiss the, the one who's on the throne. In this case, it's the son who's been set on the throne of that. Or you can refuse to acknowledge your Lord, his lordship over you. You can refuse the kiss. You can refuse to say that he's going to be the Lord of your life. In other words, our fate is determined by whether we will have him as Lord or whether we will rebel against him. Kiss the Son and live. That is, make Jesus the Lord of your life and be restored to harmony with God. Or withhold the kiss and perish. Deny Jesus and remain eternally a stranger in God. That brings us to our invitation time this morning. I'm going to ask you, will you kiss him today? Will you make him the Lord of your life? Our text states, blessed are all who take refuge in him. So this morning I ask, will you take refuge in him? This morning, if you'd like to confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you'd like to receive his salvation and become a friend of God and not an enemy any longer, we want you to have that opportunity. We invite you to come forward as we stand and sing our invitation song, Be the Center. Let's stand together.